So if you work with a smaller studio on consignment is what we call it, you're essentially handing over work that you've created on the front end that the studio then tries to sell on your behalf. Leslie Canahan runs a boutique apparel design studio called White Buffalo Studios and sells prints to apparel companies. She's also the host of the Print Life podcast and has a number of resources for artists looking to make a career making surface pattern designs for apparel. I am super excited to dig into her experience and chat more about her design studio today because this is one of a topic that is near and dear to my heart and I love I love chatting about design studios so welcome Leslie. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here and to chat with you today about fashion so prints. To get started, can you give us sort of like a brief, I mean, we'll dig into some of the finer points, but can you give us sort of a brief overview of your design background and where you're at now? Yeah. So I started out um, actually going to like fashion design school and um, left graphic design or left fashion design school and started in retail. Wasn't super happy in retail, but wasn't really sure I wanted to do fashion design. So I ended up going back to school for fine art. Um, my first job in the industry after graduating with that fine art and fashion background, I wanted to do something a little bit more bringing the art into things. Mm. So I started working at a clothing company. It was actually a sleepwear company doing mostly CAD work and kind of graphic design and just getting my foot in the door. And I started noticing we would have these studios come to us and we'd be buying prints. And then that's kind of how I learned about print design. That's how I got started kind of designing in-house was just asking questions about what is this and why are we buying these and how does that work? And I really learned on the job. Um, they gave me a shot designing and then I ended up being a full-time kind of full-time freelance in-house designer for that sleepwear company and just went from there, but was always kind of still remembering how I felt when I saw that like suitcase full of prints and the people would come in and show us all this artwork. And I'm like, I knew in the back of my mind, I wanted to start a studio so I kept freelancing for about five years. I went back and forth between freelance for design as well as in-house design and kind of just knowing I would start a studio at some point. And then in 2012, I started White Buffalo and we sell now the artwork to apparel companies that they then print on fabric for their products. I love that. So I also worked in-house. I spent um, I spent about 10 years in house and so design studios. Yeah. They're like the lifeblood of, <laughs> even though I was a print designer, you know, we still, it's, it, it can be surprising to people to under, to know that even having print designers on staff that we still buy a ton of, um, artwork from outside sources. Yes. So for th this is, you know, things that I'm super interested in digging into, um, for those who have no clue about what a design studio is, I mean, obviously we're hinting at what it is, but can you give a little bit more detail as to like how that works, how it works within the industry? Sure. So as far as what is a studio, what does it do? What does it provide? Yeah. I would say that there's, there's definitely different types of studios. That's and true. so for, from what I learned, just being an in-house designer and seeing studios come through, they were essentially, um, companies who have an in-house team of artists and designers who follow the runway, follow the market, and put together these beautiful collections of artwork for their specific client base, whether that be apparel, swim, men's, kids, you know, the wide array of things right. that they sell to. And the studios then print samples of that artwork to fabric, hire uh, a, either an in-house representative or an agent who is out of house that has their own client list that then take that artwork for you and go see all of their clients with your artwork samples to sell directly to the companies. And then the companies are basically filling in the gaps or looking for something that's going to take the lead that the designers can then use as kind of the inspiration jumping off point as yeah. the option, or we use it to purchase 
like fill ins, but that's essentially what apprentice yeah. studio is. is. So it's like creating all this mm -hmm. artwork, like the whole function of the studio is creating prints, 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 and not not products in any way, and then mm -hmm. selling those prints to mm -hmm. companies. And uh, you know, I know your background is apparel. I did work mm -hmm. for apparel for three years, but I also did a lot of home decor. So you know, we had I worked in bedding and I worked in home textiles. So there are also studios that cater to those markets as well as stationery and all those things. Um, and so it's selling that artwork work directly to those companies in order to to use it for yeah, exactly as you said. Whether it's is a kind of a this print is is so special it's going to be like this the main print in our line or it's just yeah because you need new ideas and um a fresh perspective and one thing I will say is having worked in-house you know we did so much we did basically everything on the computer so one real benefit that can that a studio can bring is sometimes bringing in hand-painted art that we couldn't do, you know, like at our cubicles, basically. So obviously yeah. studios do also provide digital work um, and that's valuable as well. Um, it's fresh ideas, but but a lot of the times it was like that hand painted stuff that we couldn't really even, you know, begin to do in our in our in-house daily lives. So so we loved when studios came came through. Yes. We got to see all that inspiration as well. Yeah. And vintage sometimes too. Vintage pieces. Yeah. Lots of vintage, vintage too. Pieces. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. That's yeah. true. So in a, for a vintage studio, it's, it's finding these older, um, yeah, older fabrics and, and if they've kind of gone past the copyright or they're going to be used for inspiration for, mm -hmm. or something. Um, so it's not necessarily always creating something new. Yeah. Um, and so as we're saying, design studios are really a, a, pillar of the industry when you're working in-house. Um, mm -hmm. There probably aren't many companies that don't buy from studios at some point or another. Um, but it's so funny to me that, you know, once I started freelancing about 10 years ago and then got into this whole sort of online world of service pattern design where many people have joined from like the art licensing side of things or who have learned through online courses or or what have you and don't have that in-house experience they know nothing about the idea of a design studio yeah which is which is what which is the reason that I actually had a course on on the subject because I knew there was a big gap between in that knowledge yeah. um so as an artist, there's two different ways to work with a studio. And it was from listening to your Print Life um, podcast that I heard the phrase on consignment, because that's not actually how, like, that's, a, I knew exactly what you meant when you said that, but that I have worked, uh, as you would say, on consignment for two different studios in, in the past, but I just kind of considered it like freelancing for the studio. That's the way I sort of considered it. I was like freelancing. And yes, the art you know, I still had to sell. So it wasn't exactly the same thing as freelancing, but can you explain how artists might partner with studios, the, the different ways that that might, that arrangement might work? Yeah. You know, I can't speak to obviously how brick and mortar studios may work with their freelance teams, because often the, the way that I learned about this was putting contracts together and working with an attorney, essentially. And when you work with an attorney, the verbiage has to be very clear. Otherwise, there can be miscommunication with designers and artists. So essentially, if you are a freelancer, you are paid a set amount of money for a set amount of time that mm -hmm. you're doing a specific job. When you're a freelancer, there's there's paperwork that essentially says you're responsible for this and this is how much we're going to pay you weekly. Gotcha. And also as a freelancer, you cannot require them to come to your place of business unless that's written into the contract. Otherwise, they're then viewed as an employee. employee. Gotcha. This is different in many places. This is speaking specifically to the U.S. where I am. Um, so if you're a freelancer, you should be getting paid in exchange for either the print, your time, or a specific project. Right. So consignment, essentially, if you want to work with a, what I call like a boutique studio, and that's what I started calling myself because I was tired of saying a small studio. <laughs> so I feel boutique studios are a bit more digital. We don't operate in exactly the same way that like a larger brick and mortar studio operates, you know, with a big team, 
in house. Um, the way that we work is mainly digital. So if you work with a smaller studio on consignment is what we call it, you're essentially handing over work that you've created on the front end that the studio then tries to sell on your behalf. During the period of time that a studio has that artwork from you, it technically belongs to the studio temporarily until it's sold. Once it's sold, you then get paid out kind of a commission or a flat rate. Every studio works differently. It's either a percentage or a flat rate. And you get paid for the art that sells. The art that does not sell, in my opinion, should go back to the designer. Not every studio does this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand how. <laughs> but the artwork is belongs to the designer um, because it's being consigned. Similarly, how a boutique would operate if you're a, a fashion designer and you have a line of swimwear and you want the boutique to sell the swimwear. They sell half of it. The other half comes back to you if you're consigning with the mm -hmm. boutique. Otherwise, they have to buy everything from you and then resell it. Right. So the two different right. kind of, yeah, how it gets a little bit confusing. And then as you say, there are sort of the, the studios, brick and mortar studios that have people who work full time in-house painting and drawing and, and et cetera. So it's just, I guess they would just earn a salaried, it's like a salaried position. They're just doing art all day long. And then yep. the studio is selling it to the best of their abilities. Yes. And the studio retains rights to everything you create, obviously, when you're right. Cause it's like an in-house position. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see how that the freelance, like me calling it freelance is, is was a misnomer. Um, but as a person who's like, I, I knew the difference. I obviously knew yeah. that it wasn't, you know, that I wasn't getting, I knew how the payment structure was working, but I guess I didn't have the language for that at the time. So I just sort of was like, yeah, I consider it like a freelance, like a freelance position. Now I, I've, I've mostly like in, in when I've talked about it, said like you're partnering with a, a studio. Yeah. So, yes. which it is a partnership. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. So, you know, I, when I started freelancing, when I left my full-time job and started freelancing, um, I had, I had worked with, you know, a lot of different studios looking at their art and buying, purchasing art from them. And then, you know, some of the first people I approached to find work were studios and so then I did work on consignment for two different studios and you know there are a lot of pros to this you know to partnering with studios but there's also some cons to to partnering with studios and I was wondering if we can chat about some of the some of the good and the bad of why this might like why an artist might think that this is a great opportunity and why what might give them pause about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find I find this to be probably one of the most interesting topics because it's going to look different for everybody. Okay. And I think that the partnerships with a studio will, number one, it will depend on the studio. But let's talk about the pros first. So I think that there's a pro to working with a studio at every stage of your design journey. It really depends on where you are. If you're brand new, just getting started, I feel like it's a really good opportunity to see if you even like designing prints for the fashion industry, mm -hmm. how to work with a brief, how to see how things are selling, how that relationship looks. And it really gives you kind of, I think, um, space and time to kind of practice your handwriting and your style and just kind of experiment and mm -hmm. enjoy like kind of getting your feet wet in that, in that part of the industry, in my opinion. And then if you are somebody who's seasoned, I think working with a studio on consignment is a really great, uh, alt, like a secondary or even a third revenue stream. It's mm -hmm. a little bit, you know, cause it's a bit of a trickle. It's not necessarily anything you can rely on. And then we'll talk about that in the cons, <laughs> yeah. but as a pro, I think getting started, getting your feet wet, getting a foot in the door, building relationships with people, seeing how it is to work with a brief. And then as a seasoned designer, it's a great, you know, another revenue stream for you where either you can funnel work you've already created, which I always um, recommend designers do, and not a lot of them do, but if you have artwork on hand, it's going, it's cyclical, right? Trends. So it's going to come and go and try reaching out to a studio and saying, take a look at this work, hasn't sold, maybe you can show it for me. Um, or again, designing to briefs and letting it be another revenue stream. Um, as far as the cons go, I would say probably the biggest 
bummer for a lot of new designers just getting started that start working with the studio is this expectation that there's going to be this consistency that just isn't mm. there. Mm. Um, there is no consistency working with the studio on consignment. I always tell designers to kind of come into it from a place of not needing income immediately. If you have the time and space to play and test it out, that's great. If you're in need of income right away, it's not the best fit in my right. experience and opinion. And then another thing that could be kind of tricky is, you know, you don't get paid the full rate for the print. You get paid mm -hmm. a, a percentage of it because you're essentially coming in and having this broad audience because either the studio or the agent or whoever you're working with has been building this client base for a very right. long time. So on the plus side, you get this great exposure but not necessarily as you, as a designer, it's under the umbrella of the studio and for a commission, not necessarily the full payout. So pros and cons, I definitely see it as a supplementary income stream. It's not by any means like a main source of income. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. I think you definitely hit all the points that, that come to mind for me. Um, for me, I feel, I feel like, yeah, you know, it's essentially speculative work, right? You're creating, you're creating this artwork, hoping that it gets sold. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are some, um, you know, you, you have some insur insurance because you are working, if you're working for a studio, you know, that the studio understands the trends, understands their clients. They're, you know, they're giving you assignments that are or briefs or whatever that are based on what they think, you know, what the, the directors are think make the most sense. So you're getting some like yeah. industry Intel. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you you have have this built-in clientele that you wouldn't have if you were by yourself, just you know, creating for your portfolio and whatever. So you so you have and and the studio wants you to succeed because the studio wants <laughs> that revenue yeah. as well, right? So <laughs> yeah. it's like there's so while it is speculative, there is it's a little different than some other spec work that we talk about and that you know people really. Um, artists really avoid because it's it's a sort of an educated gamble right that's what I would say like you know the studio wants you to succeed they're giving you this trend information so yeah it might not work out you never know who's going to buy what but you do have sort of the support um, that hopefully hopefully you know it's going to be useful artwork and then and yeah, you have, you have, you get to see the industry from the inside. And that's why I think it is a really good kind of a training ground. As far as like the season thing goes, I'm not so sure. Like I can see it. I mean, it certainly works for extra revenue. Um, but I think then we start to have to look at pricing and start to think about the, the pros and cons of, of, of that and whether it really makes the most sense. Um, but I definitely think for a newer designer, um, you know, it, it has, it has benefits for sure, which is obviously why, you know, why, I, why I'm interested in it. And it's a big part of the industry, you know? So, yeah. um, so since I brought up pricing, let's talk about pricing a little bit here. Yeah. Um, for studios, especially for apparel, Mm -hmm. all designs are pretty much sold outright, meaning yes. that it's not, all rights are transferred to the buyer. Yes. And so that is another potential con. Honestly, I, it, I could go either way on that. Some people are very protective of their artwork, so yeah. they would never sell outright. But me, like I, I'm a little bit more pragmatic and I understand that, you know, like- I always tell designers who are like, precious with their work that this is not the space for them yeah, you have to no, be right. able to be like fluid with your art and let it go and let it come and new ideas come in and out and not be very precious with it I think if we feel that attachment to our work then licensing is just the better way to go for totally sure. yeah definitely agree so this is this is an outright purchase situation and you're not getting any you know credit for it in that if they buy it outright First of all, you don't know if that art is going to end up being used. It's not like, oh, they purchased it. So next season, let me just watch J. Crew and then I'm going to see that that on a dress or yeah. whatever. It's like maybe yeah, that with the be attachment. Yeah. <laughs> but you might never see it again. You might never um, see it. As I know, I worked at 
gap for three years and designed for baby gap. And we had a full room full of prints that we'd purchased, like a huge, huge, huge closet full of archives. And that was just like the kids section. So, so yeah, it might just get buried in a closet some, <laughs> somewhere <laughs> and never see the light of day, which is a total bummer. And it's like, you can't use those motifs again. Anyways. Uh, so that is, that is something to be aware of, but, um, the other thing is that apparel prices are often on the lower end of the spectrum. So having, you know, purchased from studios in my home decor days and my apparel days, yeah. there was a big jump. Um, when I went to, um, apparel, when I went to the gap, I, there was one studio that we used to see in home decor that I loved and I thought would be perfect for the gap. And I was like, Oh, come, you know, come see, come meet with my new art directors and da, da, da. And then it was a major pricing thing. It was like, oh, your work is so cute. So how much are these? Oh, actually, like, no. So the apparel world is is kind of notoriously like at the lower end of the purchase yeah. price. Um, are you able to share the range of prices you sell prints for through White Buffalo? Yeah. Yeah. So our prints have, it's pretty standard, I would say, um, because we don't have kind of Whereas with fabric collections, how there's like the hero, the coordinate, the sim, whatever, like I call, I say they're all heroes in fashion. Like they're not necessarily, we're not going to sell a dot or a stripe or right. gotcha. something very simple. Yeah, I mean, that's a great sometimes point. like plaids or something, but I would say for the most part, each one stands on its own. The ones that are a bit more simple, we usually include with a print and we call it a twin. Um, so our prints vary. Um, very slightly from about five to six fifty for a full buyout. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, that's pretty much. I would say, like, yeah, I've seen from, yeah, a little bit lower end of like you know four fifty to yeah seven hundred. But that's again, it depending. We've done. On we've dropped to four fifty if somebody's buying like sixteen, and we're like, all right, you know. But I'm trying to stay away from that because I feel like just because they're buying a lot doesn't mean that the art isn't valuable. Yes. And I feel like everyone's constantly negotiating and mm. what we're finding happening is the quality of artwork is going to begin going down other than the artwork that's coming from the brick and mortar studios, because they're able to keep the quality here, even when the price goes down, but I don't know what they're paying. You know, I don't know what they're paying their people, but right. yeah, for, for independent studios um, like mine, I know when we have reps and agents out there with the suitcases taking the appointments, they're the ones that typically say okay to these lower prices where the studio then finds out what they were sold for. And we were like, what? And mm. uh, that's why I liked bringing it more digital. I have a little bit more control over our pricing, um, but I do think price is an issue and it needs to come up. For sure. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. So bringing in digital, you you mean that like basically people can go on your website, like you have like a sign in and people can yes. look through things, right? So yes. it's been 10 years since I've worked in house. So that was like starting to happen with a few studios when I worked in house. But for the most part, yes, they're showing up to our actual place of business with yeah, a suitcase full of full of artwork and huge portfolios yeah. and uh, slapping them down on the <laughs> on the table and we we're looking yeah. at them. So so yeah um yeah and 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 that's you make a good point that yeah if the, there can be sometimes there can be discounts and and if you were selling through agents i know sometimes that meant even a smaller cut for the artist because the agent gets a small cut as well besides the studio itself but the agent sometimes depending on like the arrangement like and so i studio. know yeah yeah hmm? Depends on the studio. Yeah. So I know yeah. one one studio that I worked for, like sometimes they would say like they were based in New York and it was like, um, you know, we they usually I think only sold. I don't they didn't usually have like a sales rep that was going around to like Europe. And I think they had some they, they but they would sometimes like once in a while have a like a European agent. But that would be that that would basically be me less we would have the option of saying if we wanted our art to be included because it was going to be sold. Mm -hmm. if we were going to get less money coming our way. Mm -hmm. so when I worked for studios in both cases, the split was 50, 50. Mm -hmm. um, and so the artist got, 50, you know, I got 50% of the sale price basically. Mm -hmm. um, 
and there's probably some degree of a range um, for. I feel like I tried to change that. I mean, when I heard that, I started thinking, okay, not only for like accounting purposes, but just for the designers. Like, I'm very pro, like supporting the designer, talking about who whose work it is that I'm showing on social, um, which wasn't a thing at, when right. I started either. But I know that for me, I give a flat rate. So you get the same thing, whether I choose to sell it here, here, or here, you get the same price, no matter what that helps with consistency. It helps with accounting. <laughs> it helps for a variety of things. Um, I don't think that the artist should be penalized if the studio or the agent has decided to take some, some crazy low offer on the artwork. Mm. Um, so what I realized for my specific business model was having the agent wasn't working because mm it was digging into the profit of the, the business profits. and being able yeah. to run the company properly. Right. But it never impacted the, the artist. Well, that's good news. Um, but well, and yeah. And I, I didn't begrudge, I don't begrudge any, you know, business for doing, if I'm begrudging anyone, it's the companies because they always want it for less and less. And yes. I do feel like we, we still happening, you know, <laughs> yes. Oh, I know. I know. Um, because I, I don't do studio work, but I freelance and still it's hard to get a good rate to, for projects and stuff because, um, because so it, it's really tricky. All right. You have this wonderful boutique studio and that means that you deal with trends a lot. And because it's apparel, you're very high fashion, you know, the runway stuff. And I've seen some of the trend boards that you guys make. Um, and I know you even have some trend services that you guys offer, which I love. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find and incorporate trends into your work? Yeah, so I... I find I had my own process. I, I spoke about it at FITM a couple of times because like, I find like everyone has their own process of trend research and just looking to the runway, just looking at, you know, boards that other people are posting or the same trends that everyone else has. I feel like then we all end up kind of regurgitating the same things we're already seeing. So I find with trend forecasting or even trend research to be more intuitive, I guess, is a better way to go, which I have like this whole process I do with like a brain dump first of just like things I'm thinking about and seeing and colors. Maybe I, I think I noticed lately and then I'll start thinking about what's going on in the world or what movies I've seen lately, what I'm watching on TV. Is there any specific era or a muse that's coming up for me again and again? And then I kind of like to take all of that and take it apart and then do a deep dive into the market and what's happening. I feel like market research is like the number one area that designers don't spend enough time in. And that's why our work's not oh selling. Times. It's a whole <laughs> thing. But if you take that market research along with like this intuitive kind of research place and bring them together, I feel like you end up with something a bit more unique. And that's what I like to do when I'm giving boards to my team. Um, I also really encourage them to put their own interpretation on things and not necessarily just mimic what's on a board too you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I think that that takes practice as well but I really like coming from a place of mixing music and film and art and television and I don't know a little bit of everything and then what do we come up with I feel like that's probably the most unique way to self-guide and to come up with boards I love that um is there anything specific you've had, like any any trend, hot trends you want to talk about right now? Anything anything specific you've been seeing lately uh, that that has been inspiring you, or just mm -hmm. my approach to trends is has been because I don't have access to like I like I don't have WGSN subscription or anything like that. You know, I just and because I'm not just apparel, like I don't really pay attention to the runways at all. In fact, I don't really do very much apparel design. I do 95% of my design work is for like gift and stationery and things like that. So I'm I'm looking a lot at what's already happening in the market because those are slow kind of turnovers. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, more like what's already out there. I think I have, I I am more like attuned to it than some people are. So I feel like I see it, you know, earlier yeah. some people are like, I can't believe this is happening. And it's like, well, it's right there at Target. Oh, like, it's not really that surprising, but some yeah. people, 
some people don't see it when I see it, I guess. But, um, but so that's how I've always, you know, ha have yeah. done it since I stopped working in the house, you know, but um, yeah. what have you been well, seeing lately? So I, I don't know. I have a lot of different takes on trends in general. And I think that before I dive into like what we're seeing, I think mm -hmm. that designers often, especially in apparel, get caught up in what we're seeing, mm -hmm. right? Reacting to what we see. And when we do that, we just end up putting things out there that they've already seen and gotcha. they're already buying from. Right. So I, I always say like zig when they zag. Um, mm. So sometimes going in the complete opposite direction can be a good approach. Mm. Um, but definitely I would say the number one trend that I've been talking about for a long time now is it's timeless over trendy and try to stick with things that you know have longevity have a long shelf life, things you can recolor perhaps with a spring palette and an autumn palette. And that would work potentially both ways. Um, kind of speaking to more like a sustainable, sustainable design practices in general, mm -hmm. because I think often with fashion prints where we get tripped up is thinking produce, produce, go, 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 chase, 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 trends, trends, trends. And then it's like, mm -hmm. you have all this artwork that's sitting around and collecting dust. And um, I think it, we need to go back to more of this place of kind of creating, obviously um, the art side of it is built on intuition and, and your own style and things you love to do, but being informed of what's happening in the market and what they're gravitating towards. So like end use, but finding a place where these all meet with that longevity. So like mm -hmm. timeless over trendy and just trying not to chase trends so much that something you just created a few months ago already feels done or old. Um, just giving it that a little bit of like classic, I don't know, giving it a longer lifespan, I guess. Is I hear what, what you're saying. saying. No, yeah. I definitely hear what you're yeah. saying. And and I get that. I think uh, I don't anymore, but I used to do trend boards in my newsletter pretty regularly. And, um, and so it's like, yeah, you know, I'm into trends, I'm into trends. And, and people would sort of ask me like, I'm scared to do trends because then, you know, my portfolio is out of date and whatever. And it's like, well, first of all, trends last way longer than you think they do, they do. <laughs> but also, um, you know, I think there's also a matter of like, you know, what we did six years ago, we're never going to like, whether it has like a sloth on it or not, like I'm talking gift, uh, you know, I think apparel doesn't really use it. <laughs> Fashion isn't necessarily putting sloth on things except for, you know, like oh, pajamas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pajamas, I guess so. But you know what I mean? Like whether it's got like a slightly outdated trend or not, like you're probably yeah. kind of over some of your work, but, um, but I guess for, uh, but I mean, yeah, you even for apparel, especially that, that must be something that you really have to consider and be very deliberate about because it is really easy to get into this, um, sort of trend trap with apparel I could see yeah for sure yeah 100 percent. and especially if you're a freelancer or you're consigning you know we're not in-house cranking and we don't have to crank and I think sometimes we feel like we need to to keep up or something we need to hit every trend and we need to chase everything we see and I think the most successful um, freelance designers that I've worked with and that I see out there are the ones that are just kind of staying in their space that they love to be in mm. And I think the easiest things that we can do is revisit old work and play with scale and color and mm. to refresh it and bring it back again and again. And that kind of work I think has the most longevity is something that you can come in, recolor, increase the scale, decrease the scale. And it's like a whole new print, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. to dig in the ar archives and refresh for sure. Um, especially, you know, doing licensing work. It's like, okay, well, if it hasn't, you know, I still have it sitting there. So it's, it's available. Yeah. Um, so besides running a studio, you're not, you're not a one, one businesswoman, <laughs> one, one single, like every artist, you've got multiple things going on. So you have a podcast, which I love called the print life podcast Thank and you. a number of resources for surface pattern designers. Um, Tell me about your shift in from sort of artist and studio owner into the education space. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I think it was, it was like 2019 when I, it really came from having my son, if I'm being honest, like I started. So in 2017, I started kind of just reevaluating where I'm putting my time, how my business model was working 
um, how the percentages were working, like how much time I was investing in the ROI on that and, and nothing was making any sense. Um, so I was looking at the numbers and my time invested into running White Buffalo and thinking something needs to change. And I kind of realized I'm trying to run a boutique studio like a brick and mortar studio. Mm. And I started to see where things weren't working. So I started doing things a little bit differently and I started being asked questions and approached from a lot of designers often, like, can you take a look at my portfolio? Can you tell me how I can increase my sales with you on consignment? Can you tell me, like, I don't know much about the fashion industry. What's the difference between that and this? And whether it be licensing or greeting cards or just other spaces. And I just kept getting asked questions. And I started thinking, I wonder if, you know, I could broaden or grow my business a bit by offering, you know, to work with designers to help them strengthen their body of work or just understand a bit better about our kind of small niche um, mm -hmm. in the surface pattern design world. And then in 2020, um, it was literally like the day we were told we were going to have a two week lockdown. Mm -hmm. and I went live on Instagram and was like, all right, I'm going to do this. <laughs> and I just started talking. I don't know which is weird because I, I have some social anxiety and I get really nervous on camera. So I don't know what I was thinking, but I went live on Instagram, by the way, for anybody with social anxiety, or if you're shy, like going live is the best cure. Mm. <laughs> um, I went live. I started talking about consignment. I started talking about contracts, working with studios, layout, having a market focus. I just started talking about everything. I did like three free workshops throughout the whole summer of the pandemic, like summer of 2020. And at the end of it, everyone was kind of like, okay, well, what else now? What else are we doing? <laughs> so I took all the content and put it into a membership because I thought that would, that felt good, like build community, have everything in there. So I started a membership. I also started like a small course specifically for apparel print design portfolio. So like, mm -hmm. if you're going to pitch your portfolio to fashion companies or studios. And so I have those two things. And then I started the podcast. It felt natural. It felt right. The timing was right. It was already in the back of my head. And then 2020 kind of gave the the need, the space, the time, the push to do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, so it sounds like probably some of the questions that you get frequently are around portfolio advice basically is that one is that some of the most common questions or do you have any other kind of like questions that you get a lot I think the the biggest questions I was getting was how do you work with the studio on consignment so that was like one of my very first things I did was consignment design uh, 101 which ended up just being pulled into something else I think a portfolio boot camp but um, the main questions I was getting was like how to be more visible on social how to find my clients how do I grow a list how do I pitch? Um, how do I, how much do I charge? And so I just kind of took all of that stuff and, and put it into a membership. So, because I feel like traditional marketing or the way people show up on Instagram, it's a little bit different for surface pattern designers. It's a little bit different for surface pattern designers and fashion. So I just really took everything I had learned about business, about marketing, about messaging, and then tweaked it for our specific space. Mm. Because that's really what will support visibility, better sales, finding your clients, right? Yeah. It's interesting. So m my first class was earning with design studios and it was all about, yeah, like what design studios are, why they oh, could okay. be a great, you know, way to, way to get your foot in the surface pattern door, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of how to pitch to a client, a design studio and then my next one was about licensing collections and basically making marketable art. And these were small-ish, small-ish courses, smaller. Um, and then in 2020, that same week, <laughs> I launched a large course, which is my still my signature course called Start Your Surface Pattern Business. And it's about nice. getting your work um ready to pitch and and like getting yourself in a, like getting a website if you you don't have one getting you know starting to make connections and then how to look for and pitch your work right but 
it's specifically kind of about pitching yourself for freelance and for licensing. And I don't mention studios at all because I already had a whole single course about studios, but yeah. I've since retired that course. And then I kind of forget that now I have this like sort of hole where I, where that was right. Because people will say like, oh, you know, I'm curious about studios and this and that. And I'm like, well, yeah, just look at, oh, wait, that's not actually part of the course and you actually can't buy that other course anymore. So <laughs> never mind. So I think I might have to start like re uh, putting some information because, you know, I mean, it's yeah. not that different, Um, but there are obviously there's, there are some things, you know, like my course also included like, you know, questions to ask a studio, like, so yeah. that if once they're interested in working with you, making sure it's a good deal for you as well, et cetera, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah. Um, so it's, it's funny that how these things evolve and then you kind of are not even sure where they came from, and where they're going. maybe right. Sure. right. I'm not so sure. No, it's <laughs> like, it, it was very organic. I think it's interesting that that happened around the same time for so many of us. I think you have these ideas and sometimes we're a little bit afraid to chase them. And it took like this <laughs> global <laughs> thing to happen for us to get kind of pushed into this space of thinking, okay, I'm just going to go for it. And I love yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I had already been planning, like I was launching at that time. I had already been planning and I was like in the middle, like it was my first like big launch. And then it was like, oh, well, but it worked out, I guess, you know, because I love had more time for online courses and all that. So it was fun, <laughs> but it was definitely like, oh, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, fun times that, that spring. <laughs> so um. All right. So you've been in this business a long time. You've worked in-house. You've been doing, uh, you know, you've run, run print studio. You teach, you've seen a lot of art out there from all sides of it, basically. Um, and so you have a, probably a similar perspective from as I do, as far as having seen a lot of things and seeing how this industry is developing. And yours is, yours is your lens is a little bit more focused on the print and the apparel and the selling outright, my lens might be a little bit different, but um, as an educator, you know, I'm, I'm always kind of looking for a balance because I am very realistic about what is happening in the industry. And, um, but at the same time, I never want to discourage anyone. Um, so it's like, I'm not, I'll never sugarcoat anything. I'll tell you the truth if you ask me. <laughs> Yeah. But, um, but it can be really difficult because, uh, you know, it, finding as we, you were already talking about earlier in this interview about like, I wouldn't ne necessarily recommend this, you know, a studio if you, as your main source of income, if you need money right away, or, um, if you're a more seasoned designer, it could be like a second or third stream. So there are lots of opportunities with licensing, with freelance, with studios making a full-time quit your job income is still really really difficult um, yeah. to build up from scratch right you know yeah. so my question for you is kind of what are your thoughts on that and the sort of so-called I keep you know we keep hearing this it's oversaturated it's oversaturated for surface designers in the market what are, what are you thinking about that I, I I get caught up in it myself so I'm curious what your thoughts are so, well, first of all, um, I think that that word is just so, so overused. It's saturated. It's oversaturated. Yeah. I think that we do use it for marketing purposes because it grabs the attention of people who think that. So I think that's why we see it a lot. Like I've even used it before. Like if you want to be more visible in a saturated marketplace, do ABC. Right. And the reason you use the terminology is to grab the attention of the people who are using that terminology. Right. right gotcha. So I definitely will say that I don't think that I think number one, I think that the idea of something being saturated is a good sign because that shows that it's alive and well, there's opportunity mm. everywhere. Mm. And the more people we see in it, I think sometimes that can feel scary and even give us like an easy out, like, oh, you know what? There's so many people trying to do that. I'm not even going to bother. It's your mm -hmm. brain trying to keep you safe. And mm -hmm. you need to like realize that if you want something, it's there for you. It's just there for you. Just go get it. It's going to be, it's not going to be easy, but it's there if you want it, if you want to do the work. And the other thing I'll say about that is it's even more of a reason to study the crap out of your market mm -hmm. and to really understand what it is that you do that's different 
and how you're going to differentiate your work in the space to cut through, to pull in the right clients. And I won't even say to like, be more visible in the space, but it's about being more visible to the people who are meant to be your clients and to let them know you're there and they don't know you're there for not showing up. And I think that the idea of it being saturated is great. That means there's opportunity for you. Um, find, find your place and go for it. As far as you were saying, like going this way, going that way, I don't think it matters. I, I have a, a reel I did a while back because I kept hearing people saying, don't sell outright or don't license. Yeah. And I'm like, you can do both. <laughs> yeah, sure can. But you have to be intentional about how you're doing it, how you're approaching it. And you can't build them both at the same time unless you have time and space to mm -hmm. wait for the money to come in. I, I highly recommend going after one at a time Agreed. and giving, giving one or the other. Maybe you can speak to this in terms of time, but what, like a year or two to like solidify one or the yes. other before you even think about adding in. Yes. Other. You can't start. I tell, I say this as well. You can't start multiple businesses at one, like trying to do either of those things is its own business, right? It could be its own business. There are people who only license their work. There are people who only sell their work. They're all they could be their own business. You can't start multiples and print on demand. Don't, you know, that's a whole nother stream of income that people get into. So mm -hmm. it's like there, you can't start that many. It's hard enough to start one business. So trying to start four at a time, like just in the name of multiple streams of income, quote mm -hmm. unquote, it's like, you, you that's no. setting yourself up for disaster. <laughs> I, I really believe that when designers, I think when we get started, I see it more from people just getting started. Like I'm going to have a licensing portfolio. I'm also going to have a, a outright portfolio. I'm also going to do POD. I'm also going to teach a watercolor class on YouTube. I'm also going to do this and I'm going to mm. do that. And all I see it as your, your hobby, it's mm. a hobbyist type of mentality rather than a business mentality. If it's a business, we need to treat it as a business. Mm -hmm. And when we're trying to build, like you said, you can't build two businesses at once. Um, and I get asked that a lot. Well, you're doing this, this, and that. And it's like, well, I did Freelance for, for five years yes. before I started a studio. And then I did a studio for 10 years before I started teaching yes. being an agent. Thing. And I'm like, you know, it's like this, you build on that strong foundation. And if we don't have the strong foundation, nothing's going to, I won't say nothing's going to work because there are those designers out there that, Outliers, yeah. that have, yeah. But I would say for the most part, you know, build that strong foundation in one space, knowing you can do whatever you want to do from there. You want to add on a product line, you know, it's like a stairs, right? Like mm -hmm. one, then that part of the business, then, and POD, you know, POD and like Etsy and all these other things. I feel like they're pieces of your, of your licensing business. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't necessarily look at them as each an individual business, but they take up your time. And like speaking to that, I'm so curious what you think about that. Like if you want to do POD and you want to do Etsy and you want to do Spoonflower and you want to do all these pieces, that's the licensing piece, right? The foundation. Wouldn't you even say as a licensing designer that you want to build a strong foundation, perhaps with your body of work on one platform first, get your stuff out there, build brand, grow your audience before you do them all? Or would you say do them all at once for licensing? Um, I, I would... Yeah, I would pick one or two, maybe if they were like sort of concurrent. Like, I mean, I know people who do. Yeah, I, I would pick one or two. Um, but that's the thing, because again, yeah, you can be really like the like Etsy versus Spoonflower. I mean, there's so that that is those are very different platforms. Those are very different. What might work on there, the pricing that works on there, the money you earn from there, the type of designs that work on there. And then all the like marketing and SEO and tagging and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's its own like journey. <laughs> so, so it's like, yeah, again, start with one. I always sort of say like, I understand why, why artists do this of, of wanting these multiple things because they're not getting anywhere with one. And so they're, they're trying to like, okay, well, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can do this. And, and while one is best, I say, if anything, if you can't, if you really can't like rein it in, do two, but do two that complement each other in a way that you can like. So for me, it was, I have a licensing agent. Um, 
and I had one since I, since I started licensing and I was already doing freelance, but I got a licensing agent. So then I looked at it as when I'm creating whatever work I want to create, that's for my licensing portfolio. I'm spending time on my licensing portfolio and my, and building my licensing, uh, business. And then when I'm looking for clients and doing client work and finding freelance connections, that's me doing my freelance thing. So when I was like hitting a wall, looking for freelance clients, then, all right, let me take a deep breath, design some work that I can send off to my agent. But basically like there was no, because I already had the agent, there was no, um, barrier of entry as far as so like pod the benefit of that is there's not really a barrier to entry you can just upload to spoon flower it might not make you a lot of money but if if like designing for your spoon flower shop is your like release then make the other thing the thing that you're you're pitching and you're working hard to to you know really um make like meaningful connections in in a certain industry or or whatever um yeah. But I mean, obviously, even spending all your time on just the one single thing is going to get you farther faster because what you focus yeah. on, yeah, you know, is going to grow. So yeah. we are where our attention is, my mentor says. Um, I think it's it's interesting because it's very similar in fashion, too, where if you want to be a successful print designer in the fashion space, then you have to build that. And the oppor the opportunity is one-to-one -one clients, an online shop, you know, pattern bank, um, even though everyone who knows me knows how I feel about that. Right. And, then, um, you know, working with the studio on consignment, maybe even part-time in-house somewhere, but like you're building that part of your business. But even in that side, there's so many things to mm -hmm. consider to generate the income that you want to generate, which is why when I see people doing both, I'm thinking like, wow, that is two really difficult businesses to try and build at the same time. But like you said, if you build up one and then it's established and you're like, here's to the agent, here's for my one client. Okay. I have some free time. Let me see how it would be to like work with the studio on consignment or, you know, pitch some prints to a freelancer to do a commission piece. And I think that that makes more sense, but it takes much longer. Yeah. True story. Um, so how can designers who are interested in apparel design work with you, learn from you? I mean, I'll certainly put your links below, but um, it sounds like what, 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 what is out there? What are the opportunities for them that you can offer them? <laughs> well, um, I have two programs. So one of them is if you want to create a portfolio specifically to pitch to apparel clients, studios, manufacturers, um, either for commission or freelance or even an in-house position. So that's called Portfolio Bootcamp. Mm -hmm. um, we're just wrapping up our live round for this year. And then the membership is more geared toward sales, marketing, branding, development, layout, um, basically just strengthening not just strengthening your body of work, but how you connect with your audience, how you grow your client list and how you learn how to be comfortable with sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. um, both of those things you can find at lesliekinahan.com. You can kind of see everything there. I have a bunch of free stuff too. Awesome. All right. Well, I'll definitely put the links. Well, it has been so great uh, talking about print studios, learning more about your business. And so I'm so, so glad we got to connect. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Head to elizabethsilver.com slash learn if you want more straightforward support with surface pattern design and creative business. Learn all about how to create successful licensing collections, how to build your surface pattern design business, how to quickly get a pitch out to a potential client, or how to use Adobe Bridge. And be sure to check out some targeted help I have with portfolios and my free workshop ready for surface pattern clients. There's a lot to see at elizabethsilver.com backslash learn.